This video is a brief introduction to the concepts of federalism and the Interstate Commerce Clause. Federalism refers to the division of powers between the federal government and state governments. The question of the proper distribution of powers between the federal government and the states is one of the most important, most enduring constitutional and political conflicts in America. In fact, this was the main debate over the ratification of the Constitution itself, with opponents charging that it gave too much power to the federal government. After America gained its independence from England, the states were reluctant to give up power to a central government. Before the Constitution was adopted, America was governed by a document known as the Articles of Confederation. The Articles of Confederation created a federal government that was extremely weak. It couldn't coin money. It couldn't tax. It had no judicial system. And amending it was virtually impossible. Problems quickly began to arise as a result of the weakness of the federal government. These problems became so significant, that only six years after the Articles of Confederation were adopted, a convention was held in Philadelphia to write a new constitution. Although the framers wanted to create a stronger central government than had existed under the Articles, they still wanted a federal government that was relatively weak, and whose powers were limited. As originally understood by the framers, the federal government could only exercise those powers explicitly listed in the Constitution. These are known as enumerated powers, and they are largely found in Article 1, Section 8. If a power isn't found in the Constitution, the federal government doesn't have it. Furthermore, the list of federal powers contained in the Constitution is quite limited. Among the powers granted to the federal government are, the power to tax, the power to coin money, the power to issue patents, the, the power to establish a postal system, the power to raise an army and a navy, and the power to establish a system of naturalization of citizens. The states were more powerful. Unlike the federal government, states do not need to point to any provision of the U.S. Constitution to authorize passage of a law. Any power that does not belong to the federal government belongs to the states, unless limited by some other part of the Constitution. Most importantly, the states possess police powers, while the federal government did not. Police powers are generally defined as the power of a government to protect the health, safety, and morals of its residents. Police powers include things like laws against the possession and distribution of drugs, law laws regulating businesses, and providing an educational system. It would also include things like regulating the cats at the Hemingway House. All of these things were considered to be a state responsibility, with no role for the federal government. As we know, the federal government today has a major role in virtually every aspect of American life, including those areas once thought reserved exclusively for the states. The federal government funds and regulates education, health care, health care, drug enforcement, transportation, employment conditions and wages, just to name a few. The founding fathers would barely recognize what the government they created has become. So how did the federal government grow so much? The full answer is beyond the scope of this video. Here, we will focus on one important factor, the Interstate Commerce Clause. Among the power explicitly granted to the federal government in Article 1, Section 8 is the power to regulate commerce among the several states. This is known as the Interstate Commerce Clause. Under the Articles of Confederation, states would frequently place taxes on goods from other states, and take additional steps to give themselves an economic advantage. The effect on the overall economy was highly negative. To prevent states from doing this, the framers gave the federal government the authority to regulate commerce between states. However, states retained the authority to regulate intrastate commerce, commerce conducted wholly within the border of a state. However, the Constitution does not define the difference between interstate commerce and intrastate commerce. The answer to this question is vitally important. Battles over the meaning of interstate commerce are directly related to battles over federal power. If the Interstate Commerce Clause is interpreted broadly, it permits a wide range of federal regulations. If it is interpreted narrowly, the power of the federal government shrinks. The Supreme Court's interpretation of the clause has varied over time. Generally speaking, before 1937, the court tended to interpret the clause narrowly, favoring state power over federal power. Between 1937 and 1995, 
the court consistently interpreted the clause broadly. In fact, for almost 60 years, between 1937 and 1995, the court overturned only one federal law because it exceeded congressional authority under the Commerce Clause. Perhaps the most striking example of the court's broad interpretation of the Interstate Commerce Clause during this period was the case of Wickard v. Filburn, decided in 1942. In order to stabilize the price of wheat, Congress passed the Agricultural Adjustment Act, which established limits on the amount of wheat per acre that farmers were legally permitted to grow. Roscoe Filburn was a small farmer who grew more wheat than the law allowed. He claimed that the law could not constitutionally apply to him, because he only grew the wheat to feed to his own pigs. Since the wheat never crossed state lines, and never even left his own property, he was not involved in interstate commerce. Supreme Court rejected this argument in a unanimous decision. The court reasoned that every pound of wheat that Phil Byrne fed to his pigs was one pound of wheat that was not purchased in interstate commerce. And although Phil Byrne's effect on interstate commerce was small and indirect, the cumulative effect of millions of farmers doing the same thing would be substantial. Congress therefore had the right to regulate even wheat production for personal use. use. The court was very consistent in its support of federal power from 1937 to 1995. But the court entered a new era of federalism jurisprudence in 1995 when it decided the case of U.S. v. Lopez. In order to help combat gun violence in schools, Congress passed the Gun-Free School Zone Act of 1990. This law banned possession of a handgun within 1,000 feet of a school. After being convicted of violating the law, Alfonso Lopez challenged it before the Supreme Court, arguing that it exceeded federal authority under the Commerce Clause. The federal government argued that possession of handguns near schools affected interstate commerce in two ways. First, gun violence near and on school property led to increased insurance rates, leaving less money for educating students. Second, increased violence leads to decreased learning, which produces less educated and less productive citizens, which harms interstate commerce. Most observers expected the court to uphold this law, as they had virtually every other federal law to face a Commerce Clause challenge since 1937. But the court struck down the law in a 5-4 vote that was divided along ideological lines. The court's majority said of handguns near schools and interstate commerce was too tenuous and remote. They argued that school safety has traditionally been considered a state and local issue, and that laws like this shatter the distinction between interstate commerce and interstate commerce. The dissenters argued that the court was illegitimately substituting its judgment for that of Congress, which held hearings and determined that a link between handguns near schools and interstate commerce does indeed exist. It is important to note that this case did not involve the Second Amendment's right to keep and bear arms. Keep and bear arms. The court held that Congress could not pass this particular legislation because it had an insufficient connection with interstate commerce. As a result, there was no need to consider the Second Amendment. This case new era in which the court became much more willing to strike down federal laws as exceeding congressional authority under the Commerce Clause. However, the court's record in this period has been mixed, because it has also upheld several laws in which the link with interstate commerce was more clear. For example, the court upheld a law forbidding states from selling driver's license information to private companies. It also upheld the power of the federal government to criminalize marijuana, even in states, like California, that have legalized it. Legalized it.